So are we running out of electricity? I mean, seriously, this is the chart that really got my attention. It basically shows how demand for power in data centers is expected to rise in the US over the next five years. Now, if you look carefully between 2024 and 2030, electricity demand in the US is set to increase by 400 terawatt hours, growing at 23% every year. That's 400 trillion watt hours. Now, to put this into perspective, that's like powering 36 million homes in the US for one year, 24 seven. Or to put it another way, this number is about 10% of annual electricity generation. So we're going to need to produce a lot more energy than we currently have, right? But why? What's actually happening here? Think about it. We've got AI at our fingertips, fully autonomous self-driving cars hitting the streets, internet access from nearly any location on earth, and of course, enough cat videos to last a lifetime. But all of this technology, it runs on something real and something must be powering all of it. Now imagine every Google search you made, every chatbot conversation you've ever had, and every social media post you've uploaded, all that energy came from a giant warehouse full of power hungry servers located somewhere in the world. And the crazy thing is that all of this power, it's not slowing down. In fact, it's going up and it's increasing at a rate we've never seen before. So the one thing that I'm concerned about is if we can produce enough energy to meet all of this demand and figure out if we'll run out of it. But here's the thing I'm curious about. Can our energy supply infrastructure really keep up? The pace of this energy demand from big tech, especially AI, is going to look very different in the next few years. We're now seeing companies that rely on these data centers taking massive steps to find better ways to not only supply the power, but also more efficient ways to save it. I really wanted to find out exactly what are the key factors pushing this demand. And more importantly, where is this energy actually gonna come from? Oh, and by the way, in this video, you'll see me refer to a bunch of stuff using the unit called watt hours. Just think of this generally as total energy consumption. Also, I'll be using words like power and energy interchangeably throughout, but I totally recognize there are a few nuances between the two. So I'll put the definition of both in the description to give you some context. All right, without further ado, let's dive in. Let's first zoom out for a sec and take a look at energy demand globally. It's been going up and up and up for decades. More people, more gadgets, more everything. Take a look at how energy consumption has changed over the past 200 years. You can really start to see how energy demand has changed not only in size, but the types of sources generating this energy, which became really noticeable from the 1950s. As the world moved into the 1990s, the internet began to change our lives. It allowed us to connect and communicate with people instantaneously, search for information, and make us more productive than ever. But all of this comes at a huge physical cost. And this cost is getting bigger every year. You see, our growing need for this online connection and digital content already set off a chain reaction. In the early days of the internet, as more people got connected, companies like Google, Amazon, and Microsoft had to build out massive facilities called data centers, basically to store and process all this information we were generating. So suddenly everyone wanted to store their photos, videos, and just about everything online. So case in point, you're probably watching this video right now being streamed to you directly from one of Google's many YouTube servers somewhere in the world. And so these data centers weren't just small server rooms, they evolved into enormous buildings and warehouses designed to handle everything from search queries and streaming video to online shopping and social media. So over the past few decades, the explosion of the internet has meant that these big tech companies have been forced to expand its infrastructure, which in turn demands even more power. Now, if we were to fast forward to today, all of this energy demand isn't slowing down. If anything, it's accelerating. And while this demand for the internet set the stage, there's been a recent surge over the past decade and it's been driven by three key areas. The first one is cloud computing. These are the services that power everything from our storage and streaming services to software and the way we connect with people. Think WhatsApp or FaceTime. The huge data centers that host these services run 24-7, 365 days a year, eating up huge amounts of energy, not only for computing, but also for cooling and reliability as well. The next one is crypto mining. Over the past few years, we've seen cryptocurrency networks require enormous compute power for mining. Bitcoin is a perfect example. The Bitcoin network is extremely energy intensive, so much so that at times crypto mining operations have rivaled even large industrial sectors in power usage. 
Currently, the global Bitcoin network sits at 175 terawatt hours per year. Take a look at this graph from the CBCI, which is like the Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index. You can see that the jump in demand really starts from 2017. We call this the J-curve. Now to put this into perspective, you can also view it another way, where Bitcoin's energy consumption would be comparable to that of Egypt or South Africa, that's pretty insane. And this is how it compares to other countries. Look, in any case, crypto is making a huge dent on compute, and it's only going to get more crazier with the US declaring it wants to make itself the crypto capital of the world. The United States will be the crypto capital of the planet and the Bitcoin superpower of the world. And finally, last but certainly not least, is the big kahuna, artificial intelligence. AI has emerged as this huge driver of energy demand, and it's only going to get bigger. Training and running advanced AI models require a bucket load of GPUs and specialized hardware. For example, a single AI query on ChatGPT could use as much as 10 times the energy of a typical internet search. It turns out that the need for AI compute is now pushing the limits of what our power grids were originally designed to handle. So it's like this perfect storm, right? Cloud computing, crypto, and now AI, all converging at once, all demanding more and more energy. It's like we built this incredible digital world for all of us, but we're now just starting to realize how much fuel it actually needs. But let's keep going along this thread of AI because while we can definitely see the size of this demand across the three areas, I wanna zoom in on one of the more fascinating drivers behind this AI surge, the AI hyperscalers. Hyperscalers are good. Hyperscalers. The hyperscalers. Hyperscalers. The hyperscalers. So what exactly are AI hyperscalers? Well, these are the tech giants. Think Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Meta, who are not only providing the traditional cloud services, but also building an entirely new generation of data centers specifically for AI training and inference. Now, unlike traditional data centers, these hyperscaler facilities are built on a massive scale. They're engineered to handle thousands of servers, GPUs, mainly powered by NVIDIA chips, and specialized hardware that can process multi-billion parameter models. You probably have heard of them in the news like OpenAI's GPT models, Meta Llama's 3.1, Google's Gemini, and, and so many others. For example, a single hyperscaler facility can consume over 100 megawatts of power, which is basically what a small city needs to operate continuously. That's wild. But it's not just about size. These hyperscalers are rethinking how data centers can work. Everything from custom infrastructure that uses real-time automation to modular designs that let them expand rapidly. This means they're not only scaling up capacity, they're also investing heavily in energy efficiency as well. These innovations are super important because as the models get more complex and the need for computation goes up, that's also more energy saved. But there is a bit of a problem. These hyperscales are really pushing local power grids to their limits. In some regions like Northern Virginia, which is a global hotspot for these data centers, the rapid build-out is already straining transmission lines and sparking debates about grid capacity and reliability. AI hyperscalers are not just traditional cloud players anymore. They're bigger and much hungrier for energy than ever. It's fair to say that our power grids weren't designed for this. So this got me thinking, how do we make sure we can produce enough energy to meet this demand? And is there a better way? You see, our current energy supply methods are struggling to keep up. Right now, most data centers get their power from the traditional electric grid. But here's the kicker. That grid is largely fueled by a mix of fossil fuels, natural gas, coal, and an increasing but still somewhat patchy contribution from renewables like wind and solar. It's a system that, while it's evolved over decades, isn't really built for the explosive 24-7 demand we're now seeing with the AI boom. Take cooling, for example. Data centers generate an enormous amount of heat, and keeping those servers at optimal temperatures is a huge task. Most facilities use a combination of both air-based cooling, think giant air conditioners and chilled water systems, and in some setups, liquid cooling methods, such as immersion cooling, is also used. In many centers, cooling can consume anywhere from 10 to 40% of the total power used by the facility. Now here's the thing, we know that fossil fuels, while abundant, come with a huge carbon cost. Renewables like solar and wind are great, but they're intermittent and sometimes can't reliably provide the round-the-clock power needed for these data centers. So is there another way? The nuclear, 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 nuclear decay. All right, here we go again. This is where nuclear energy is stepping back into the conversation as a potential game changer. I know, I know nuclear is supposed to be bad. We've seen it with Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima. It's a very contentious subject, but today's nuclear tech might not be the nuclear tech of the old days. But 
Before I go into why, let me talk about why nuclear power is even coming back onto the table after such a long time. You see, nuclear is very unique. It's unique because it offers a continuous, reliable stream of power that's essentially carbon-free. It's not dependent on the weather, and it has one of the highest energy densities of any source. Also, look at this diagram from the US Department of Energy, where you can also see nuclear energy has by far the highest energy capacity factor, meaning nuclear power plants are producing maximum power more than 92% of the time during that year. In fact, nuclear energy is now so promising that Microsoft recently signed a 20-year deal with a company called Constellation Energy to restart a reactor to deliver 800 megawatts of clean power by 2028. Google are also partnering with startups like Kairos Power to develop something called small modular reactors called SMRs. Okay, so to understand SMRs, let's get back to why today's nuclear technology is different than what it was in the old days. Traditional nuclear power plants are enormous custom-built projects that can take a decade or more to plan, finance, and construct. Think of these as massive concrete and steel structures designed to generate thousands of megawatts with huge reactor cores and safety systems. On the other hand, modern reactors like SMRs are designed from the ground up to be, well, you know, small and modular. They're built with a different philosophy. They have passive safety systems, meaning they can shut themselves down without human intervention, and making them more modular allows for easier construction and improved quality control. SMRs also promise a quicker and more efficient way to generate nuclear power. In fact, these next-gen reactors are designed to be built off-site in factories, shipped in modules, and then built really quickly when they arrive on site. And of course, there's even talk of nuclear fusion become a reality one day. While still in the experimental stage, fusion research is gaining massive investments from investors. Although it remains decades away from commercial use, companies like Helion Energy they're working on breakthroughs that could change how we produce clean energy, and I think this would be the game changer we've been all waiting for. And hey, maybe AI itself could be part of the solution. MIT researchers are starting to use AI to design ultra-efficient chips and algorithms that slash energy use. It turns out that AI can help reduce waste, lower energy consumption in data centers through smarter cooling systems, and even assist in the design of these next-gen reactors. So it could be that even if AI is a big driver of increased energy demand, it can also help us use energy more wisely, but we'll see if it actually works. At the end of the day, there is no doubt that global energy demand will continue to rise whether we like it or not, and it's up to us to find a balance in meeting this demand in a sustainable way. By the way, I know that I could have talked about nuclear until the cows came home, but that wasn't my intention. My goal was to simply understand more about nuclear as a potential energy source. Nuclear is becoming super attractive, in part because there is this global push for low carbon and cheaper energy production. Instead of relying on solar or wind, which comes and goes, nuclear power can provide a steady output that can be scaled to meet the demand. And yeah, I totally understand that nuclear can be a taboo in some circles, but I don't think that should be the case. Just like any energy source, there will always be pros and cons that come with it. But if we can at least start the conversation again around nuclear, my hope is that it will better inform the public about the technology and its potential. So what does this mean for the future? Will we run out of energy? Well, one thing is for sure, that AI's energy hunger is a wake-up call for all of us. It's a forcing function for us to innovate faster, build smarter, and rethink what's possible. I don't think the lights will go out anytime soon, but it's only if we stop fighting about how to keep them on. It's times like this where I believe that constraint is truly the mother of innovation. So what do you think? Drop a comment, and I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on all of this. And if you like the content, hit subscribe and like, and you'll get notified when videos are released. I'll see you next time.